Oh my God. <laughs> I'm in love with a man I haven't even seen. <laughs> I wish you could see my face. I wish I could see your face too. I would have never imagined sitting in a freaking box and genuinely like being able to like feel this alive. You know, I've always felt like I could get women, but I never felt like I was chose by the one like that mm. I wanted. What are your fears with this? I don't have any like major fears. You don't have fears? No, because mm -hmm. I love you. I don't believe a word that comes out of any of these men's mouths. So did we talk about something light? No. My head is spinning. I'm about to throw up. I need someone that can help me with that. If you need someone to hold your hand and guide you and coddle you, she will never be me. And she'll never be a woman like me. <laughs> you do not believe me did this to right, me. Will never. They always say that watching reality TV is about shutting down your brain. People want like like a fairy tale. But I believe it's also a window into who we really are. I got these walls up. Everybody got this perception. Yeah. <laughs> I never really did therapy, so it's just like breaking down a different side of me, you know what I'm saying? We get so invested in these people who do the craziest things in the name of love, like literally proposing to someone they haven't met behind the wall. I want to know if you'll meet me at the altar in your white dress. I will a thousand percent marry you. And then watch them unleash their innermost demons after they meet in person. I'm then thankful. I said, watch your fucking show with you and you say I'm too clean and then went upstairs and I had sex with you? That's yeah. so funny. Well, if you're gonna bring up the sex, you're the one that wanted to have sex. Yeah, I also did. Also, maybe wanted a little breather from that too. And we make fun of them, of course, and analyze them from the comfort of our seats and say we are nothing like them, that we would never behave in this way. But that's just something we tell ourselves to convince ourselves that we're emotionally healthy. If I present myself well, they'll never guess the chaos going on like inside of me. But the truth is we crave love as badly as they do and we are just as scared of it as they are. I'm gonna get emotional, but I don't know why like the same things keep happening to me yeah. over and over and over. And watching people mess it up on our behalf is of course a lot easier than going through it. If I see a red flag, I'm like, oh, well, I'll just paint my nails red to match. You know, last year I started teasing this video that I would do this long documentary about the behind the scenes of all dating shows, not just Love is Blind. And I actually did an interview with Isabel Morley, a psychologist based in the US, who actually started the UCAN Foundation with Nick from season two of Love is Blind to protect reality TV stars and expose a lot of the stuff that happens. And ever since that interview, she opened my eyes to how judgmental I have been about all these contestants. Because if you go back through my older videos, yes, it's true, I was always compassionate in, to a certain degree and point out the mistakes in myself that I see in them. But at the end of the day, the videos were all about calling people narcissistic and diagnosing people left, right. And after that conversation with Isabel, I started finding it very hard to ignore the escapism that I do, not only by watching these shows, but while judging the people on them. And this escapism was very glaring this season because I'm watching it while what's going on in Gaza is going on. The horror show that is happening in Gaza because I'm also Palestinian. And I've never needed escape as much as I need it right now. But I have to say, it did suck me in because I do love that show, because I crave love, just like these people. Are you really, like, ready for something that crazy serious? Yes. You should have seen my face. <laughs> because beyond the trash TV, actually the premise of the show is quite beautiful. Now, a lot of people say that a lot of these contestants are, you know, there for clout, fine, maybe. But the premise of wanting love and being afraid to be hurt by love, that's very relatable. What the actual fuck is wrong with men? So they sucked me in. They got me, gal! No, but seriously, like, part of me found it pointless to watch, but part of me was enjoying it and feeling guilty that I'm enjoying this, but I'm still enjoying it and still watching it. I can't believe the conundrum that I'm in. And the bottom line is, it was just a much needed escape from the real life tragedy that's going on. But what I found very interesting is that even in the entertainment and the escape, what's appealing the most is the tragedy. The tragic characters, the ones with zero self-awareness. It got me thinking, are we just as delusional as these people we love to hate? We are, aren't we? Welcome to the party. <laughs> We're all uncomfortable. You finally arrived. <laughs> <laughs> because actually the tragedy and the drama in a show like Love is Blind comes from how badly these people want love and how badly they need validation. I'll just give you the biggest hug. Oh my God. 
I could use that right now. You have no idea. It's the same way we crave it, albeit in a much more private way, because I would never go on a show. I mean, I would love to be on a reality show, but not a show like this, where your entire dirty laundry is aired. Also, you're leaving it on the hands of a producer. Uh-uh, no, ma'am. And yes, again, a lot of them are there for clout and blah, blah, blah. Who isn't? I mean, I, I love me some clout. But they do want love, just like we all do. And who doesn't want to get lost in the moment, lost in love? You have me in a freaking chokehold with your words. So these people are living out the fairy tale for us. And we get to make fun of them, of course. It is a short amount of time mm -hmm. to establish if this is the person you want to spend your life with. Mm. It seems more and more normal each day. But deep down, we want it to. Because deep down inside, we're also just babies. Babies walking around in adult costumes, pretending to be all grown up with all our issues resolved. But nothing is resolved, girl. In there. The presence, you know, I'm a baby. I'm a baby. You, you know, are right? a baby. Yeah. I can feel you sinking in. It's hard to look away because the needs that drive this childish behavior are actually very recognizable. Are you not feeling me or are you are? Be honest, how many times have you felt that feeling where you were just so anxious to know if somebody likes you as much as you like them and that kind of anxiety ends up driving that person away? You just need to know, do you want me or not? That's why it's so intoxicating to watch these reality TV stars crumble and crack under the pressure of finding love. My ego is like, fucking with me so hard, but I'm really trying to be very understanding and work with you on this. It's literally like watching a train wreck or a car accident. Have you ever been on a highway and passed by an accident and just went home and started Googling like what the hell happened to the people in it? This is our survival instinct at work. This acts like a preventative mechanism to give us information on the dangers to avoid and to flee from. Witnessing destruction, whether it's in a real life accident or through a character on a TV being self-destructive, actually gives you the opportunity to confront your fears from the safety of your home. We watch because it allows us to feel the intensity of the emotion without going through the real life disaster. And we get to ask ourselves from the comfort of our home, what would I do in a situation like this? How would I respond? And then of course you can concoct all sorts of stories that probably have nothing to do with how you would actually behave in real life if you were faced with that. For example, while watching Chelsea, I had to ask myself, like, would I walk away from real love, like the love that Trevor was giving her? I know I saw on social media that Trevor turned out to be not the great guy that we saw him on the show to be, but more on that in the next video. But for now, for the sake of this video, we're just analyzing what we saw on the show. Because as far as Chelsea's concerned, there was a guy who was giving her the love that she always says she needs, but then she just walked away from it. And when I was watching that, I'm like, oh my God, that's so stupid. Why would you do that? Surely I'm not. As delusional as she is surely i would not do that even though i've done that 20 times i can't give you all of me right now do you have a reason why no i don't or would i be like jimmy and convince myself to stay with someone i clearly don't want to be with it's you it's it's freaking you <laughs> i love you really could care less what you look like <laughs> She definitely, she definitely lied to me on how she looks. But, at, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And could I endure the pain of being dumped like Jessica? And you let me pour my heart out to you more than once. Would I have the strength to recover? There's a lot of fears. There's a lot of fears that exist. Speaking of fears, this is why I avoid love because I'm just so afraid to be hurt and dumped and ignored and used and just thrown to the side. Which I know is such a, not an irrational fear, of course, it could happen. But when a fear starts paralyzing you and keeping you alone, that's when you know you're in trouble. And this is why, by the way, I started going to therapy. Well, I still didn't go to my first session, but by the time you watch this video, I would have gone to my first session. So, cause I did like three years of therapy back in 2013 and, and they were very helpful. And I internalized a lot of those tools and my life started improving a lot since then, like my career and I got sober and all of that. But I think I've hit a wall when it comes to the area of love. I always tell my friends, like, it's almost like there's something behind the wall that I don't see. And it's probably a lot simpler than I'm imagining it to be, but basically I can't for the life of me see what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> so I need help. <laughs> and this is as good a time as any to introduce my lip sync guest for the week. Alan Watts. I love this man. He used to call himself a spiritual entertainer. He's not necessarily a love expert, but this bit here is where he talks about love and falling in love. I just adore it. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about a particularly <laughs> dangerous form of divine madness, which is called falling in love. Uh, which is, from a practical point of view, one of the most insane things you can do. Because 
perfectly plain and ordinary person can appear to be a god or goddess incarnate, that one can say in the words of an old song, every little breeze seems to whisper Louise. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, really, when we go back then to falling in love and say, it's crazy, falling. Oh, my God. You see, we don't say rising into love. There is in it the idea of the fall, because you don't really know that the floor is not going to give under your feet. But this is the most powerful thing that can be done. Surrender. See? And love is an act of surrender to another person. Total abandonment. I give myself to you. Take me. Do anything you like with me. Hey y'all, it's your girl Indy, your boy Indy. As I always say, I'm in denial so you can wake up. The Zionists are in denial so you can wake up. <laughs> I want to quickly thank all the new members and all the people who donated on my last video, which was about Palestine. And if you know me from my Palestine content, just know that I'm still working on another video, which I teased on my community page, basically about the portrayal of Palestinian grief. And that's coming in March. And I may have an official sponsor for the first time for that video. That one's gonna be a long documentary and it's gonna be good. But that's coming in March. So for now, let's escape together into Love is Blind. And if you're an old subscriber and have been following my channel because of Love is Blind, well, it's here. You're welcome. Eat it. So the main focus of this video is how the characters on Love is Blind mirror us. Basically, in other words, what we find relatable about them. And the most uncomfortable reflection in the mirror in that show. I love you and I give you so much of me and I like, I want you to give me all of you. Yes, those two. Every time they come on the screen, I'm like watching them like, uh, <laughs> no, why? Stop. But of course I can't look away because I see myself in both of them. Like Chelsea, how she spirals in her insecurity and makes her feelings the responsibility of the other person in front of her. I want to have a life with you. I want that more than anything else. I want to feel it and I don't really feel it right now. And Jimmy and how he feels obliged to soothe her while clearly swallowing and pushing down his frustration that you could see on his face. My God, is this guy gonna explode? And he's definitely not going to marry her. And it should go without saying, you don't need to be a psychologist, of course, to figure that out. But a bond at, as toxic as the one between Chelsea and Jimmy is clearly coming from that good old attachment wound. Chelsea herself has told us more than once how much she fears being abandoned and left and cheated on because that's happened to her in literally in all her relationships. I've dated people who have really good girlfriends and they've all cheated on me with the good girlfriends. That's why I really think she was so jealous of Jessica, she can't even see straight. Like the time where she actually ends up confessing to him towards like, I think it was in episode nine when she's like telling him that she's worried because that was the day that she knew Jimmy finally saw a picture of Jessica, the girl he said no to in the pods. And Jessica's very hot, like she's a Kardashian type. And she was like, oh my God, I thought you saw that picture. And I was like, damn it. In my head, I think like, he saw a picture of her, now he's like thinking like, damn it, I fucked up, which is not right for me to think. And then she proceeds with no self-awareness whatsoever to tell him that you've been searching for trouble ever since you saw the picture of Jessica. You started causing these problems and digging for shit the second you saw Jess's picture. It's not about Jess at all. <laughs> That's literally what you're doing. If anything, like Jimmy's not perfect and I'm not defending him, but Jimmy's the opposite of someone who's trying to search for trouble. He's pushing down all his true feelings just to please her. I have told you I love you more than any of the guys have told their fiancés. That's a fact. I don't give a fact. shit about them. I'm saying I have told you an excessive amount, in my opinion. I love you, and I want to be with you, and I want a life with you. You didn't kiss me once today. I did. You never tell me you I love me. You twice. Okay. And then the next morning, they just like make up and they tell each other, I love you again. I love you, and I want nothing more than a future with you. Now, there's a trauma bond if I've ever seen one. And again, to bring it back to what's relatable, that kind of trauma bond scares the shit out of me. That's why I avoid relationships. Because I grew up watching my parents like not have a very great time 
together. Like there were years where they were in love, but there were years where they were like going at it. And not to blame them, I adore my parents. Thank you for bringing me into this world and for teaching me everything that I know. But when I watched them fight, that scared me. And I thought, okay, I don't want love to destroy me like it has done my family, as the pink song goes. <laughs> So what it ended up doing in my brain is that cycle of fighting is unavoidable if you fall in love. That's what I always believed. Look, technically speaking, falling in love with someone and handing your heart over to someone is mad. You, you are giving up control. And all sensible people must retain control. We need control in our lives. But control is an illusion. You never really have control. And I know this from personal experience in my career. The second my career started taking off and creatively I started getting fulfilled is when I stopped being obsessed of wanting everything to turn out exactly how I'd always planned. Like, I never thought I'd be doing theater, for example. I never thought I'd be doing drag, any of that. Of course, I knew I loved storytelling. But the second I started letting go and trusting life and listening kind of the, to the direction that, the, for the lack of a better word, the universe is giving me, things started to get better. So I want to learn how to trust life also in love. So if you think about it, the really sensible thing to do is to let go completely, which is also kind of mad. So we come to the strange conclusion that in madness lies sanity. And this is an extraordinary disruptive experience, a subversive experience in the conduct of human affairs. And we try to resolve it sometimes by making it the basis for a marriage. We have arrived at the idea of the romantic marriage. You are supposed, therefore, to fall in love with someone and then enter into that relationship with a legal contract and do solemnly curse and swear that you will be faithful to each other until death do you part. Which leads often to murder. <laughs> and speaking of Jeremy, who we just saw listening to Alan Watts, like, you know what happened at the end of episode nine, the last thing we saw is him basically going off with Sarah, the girl that he connected to in the pods and being in the parking lot with her till like five in the morning. I could have gotten a text last night. I could have gotten any f acknowledgement as, as your fiance, the one you chose. Where were you? In the parking lot. We keep playing with fire. I literally knew, I knew when I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, I was like, I would bet my bottom dollar that you were with Sarah Ann. But by the way, this messy situation that Laura finds herself in with Jeremy, she predicted herself from the very beginning. I knew this shit was gonna happen. And to bring it back to the relatability of these characters and how we see ourselves in them, this I found so relatable is how she's preempting disaster, predicting misery will come, almost like willing it to come into her lives. Because if you saw her interacting with Jeremy before she discovered this whole maybe cheating or not cheating, whatever he was doing in the parking lot, before that happened, she was always very tense. Like before she met him, she kept like emphasizing how OCD she is and she can't be with a man that she has to clean after. She's I'm not here to be someone's mother. And I've like had like arguments with like guys I've dated and they're like, no guy is ever gonna like keep the sink clean. And then when she met him and he turned out to be very clean, she's like, oh, maybe he's too clean. This is really clean. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of serial killer a little bit, giving serial killer vibes. And then when she was about to introduce him to her family, she was so tense, walking around, fidgeting. I'm gonna like just speed through it just to show you her body language. Like she could not stand still for a second. And she's like warning him, oh my God, my family, they might not like you. And she's catastrophizing everything, like preempting the worst possible scenario. I'm talking about her parents, that they're boring and just basically talking down her family. And then the family show up and they're really lovely. You love this guy? Yeah. You guys talk pretty harshly to each other sometimes. I'd like to see you come out of it on the other end. <laughs> I like him. And he seems to really like her and, uh, you know, put up with some of the stuff that she can dish out. And they were trying to convince her to like, you know, be more open towards Jeremy. She's very strong-willed. If you make her into a princess and put her on a pedestal, she'll walk all over you. She's like searching for trouble. And also, you know, she's a big, <laughs> she loves tearing that pot. She's always trying to cause trouble for other people. Like when she met up with Jessica. With Jimmy, have you looked him up on social media? Has he looked you up on social media? You're not repulsed by him. No. You he has a good voice, yeah. Do you think that he would want to see me? <laughs> yeah. She's trying to plant the seed in Jessica's mind to go after Jimmy, who's with Chelsea. Basically, you're trying to put Chelsea in the same position that you're in now with Jeremy and the other girl. 
Is constant gossiping... By the way, I can't help but think of a quote from Brene Brown. She mentioned once that gossiping is a way of hotwiring a connection, like just faking a connection, because I think that's also quite relatable. That when we're sitting with someone we don't have a lot in common with and we don't know what to say, we just start gossiping about someone else because that's a way to be like, okay, we're connected by hating someone else. Speaking of Brene Brown, by the way, her stance on Palestine and Israel, mm-mm, mm-mm. I'd expect this from like, a CEO or someone who's like trying to protect their business, but your business is about vulnerability and compassion. Read your own books. But let's go back to how these characters on Love is Blind are relatable. Basically what I find the most relatable about them is how they shoot themselves in the foot, how they stand in their own way by forcing themselves to feel something they clearly do not. And when the circumstances around them and their own bodies and their own feelings are telling them otherwise, they still feel clueless. Holy shit. This should be a really, really happy feeling. And it is, it's all good. It doesn't seem that way. And this confusion is genuine. It's almost like how when you're watching a character in a horror movie and the killer is coming up behind them with a knife, you're like, bitch, it's right there. This is what you should be doing. But they can't see it. In our own lives, we're like the characters in our own movie. We can't see, we're just caught up in the day to day. So it's very difficult for us to see how we are talking ourselves into a relationship that we don't actually want. Like when Clay was about to propose to AD. I love AD. I love AD. I definitely love AD. Sure, Jan. And even after they met, when he was just at that awkward scene by the sea when he was eating that soup. And then suddenly he has this switch. Like he became possessed. Suddenly he's like, was just gripped with fear. What is like the biggest roadblock? What just happened? Nothing, nothing, I'm good. I'm just, I just, I'm just thinking, man. I'm not, I'm good. Like. Cause he so badly wants to believe that that relationship with AD is good. They both do. Just watch their facial expressions. These two know this is not gonna happen. And they know they're not right for each other. But this idea of convincing yourself that being in this relationship is what's right for you is something that's very relatable. I recognize this idea of constantly like talking yourself into, no, I need to stay. No, this is the right thing. No, I must do this. Like this is very relatable. A lot of people do that. And really, I noticed with Clay a lot here, even after they went into the apartment and they're sitting on the sofa, it's almost like he's having a, a dialogue with the voice in his head like, yeah, yeah, I can do this, yeah. Yeah, but no, I do like it. I do like this. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice. Oh, but I, I can do this, yeah, yeah. It's like, who's telling you you can't? The inner voice, bitch. That's who. But so much of what Clay does is forced. Like when AD's telling him about her family and like her sister or something like that, he's like, oh, wow, 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 oh, wow, yeah, wow. I actually talked to my other sister. Really? Mm-hmm. Talk to my mom. Wow, 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 wow. And just like with Laura before, the signs that this relationship between Clay and AD is going to shit was there from the very beginning. I was actually thinking about getting a cat. What'd you think about that? Absolutely not. I like the fact that cats, you don't need to show them love all the time, you know? That's a problem for That's me. a problem you need love all That's the time. a problem. <laughs> Truth be told, what they connected to on the most is how much they both need validation, which I don't know if that makes a good match, but they both are constantly going on about, I need to be validated, I need to be validated. Your words of affirmation has been very helpful for me because uh, I was actually kind of doubting myself through this process, you know? That's so relatable. And watching them embarrass themselves to get that validation actually feels good because we feel like we're benefiting from the experience without having to endure the negative aspects. And this might be particularly appealing to people who are naturally more risk averse. But to look on the bright side of why we watch these people on reality TV is that when you watch people like that, especially shows like Love is Blind, where there's character development, where you follow the people for a long period of time and you watch them go through like big stakes emotionally and see them being afraid and with their family and face all these triggers, it actually teaches you a lot about human behavior. Even if this reality TV seems like the least highbrow of all the genres. That's a red flag for me, but I'm such a fixer ho that I would be like, it's okay, practice on me. Like by watching contestants make poor decisions, we can develop our own opinions while studying them in different situations. It may offer even material for critical discussion and dare I say, soul searching. 
But thinking about something, whether critically or otherwise, is very different than living the experience. Watching someone get married and basically navigate that tough balance between romance and the practicality of marriage is different than applying it yourself. Because in reality, making a romantic marriage work is about balancing desire and pragmatism. And that is a very hard balance to do. I mean, desire, I've got on lock. And pragmatism, I do in my career and I don't take things personally and I just keep moving on up but in romance like everything offends me yeah again crippled and paralyzed by all these fears of what could happen is he gonna cheat on me am i gonna cheat on him and speaking of cheating by the way clay is tormented by the fear of cheating because he grew up in the shadow of a father who's a big you know cheater by his own admission the way i did grow up with my father yeah. and like how i seen like cheating as a regular thing and by the way don't you notice that clay is obsessed with the image of his father as a suave man. My dad is a very suave man, Guyanese man. My dad's a suave guy, mm -hmm. always when go with women. My dad is one of the most smoothest and suave guys I mm. know. It's like he idealizes him, and at some point he tells AD, his wife-to-be, it's like, my father's gonna hit on you. <laughs> Might be flirting with you. I gotta watch my dad, you know? Oh, gosh. <laughs> also, AD, does this weird baby voice. Gosh, I think he's just found the perfect way to say it. Say it. If you're a straight man watching this, please enlighten us in the comments. Like, do straight men like it when girl put on this baby voice? AD was doing it already from the pod. Like, oh, oh, what is that? And you know, by the way, that voice is fake because at some point when she was having a real moment with Clay, she was like, I could have put on that voice for you, but I didn't. And I came in here raw. I could have put on my little voice and just like gave you what you needed, but I didn't have that. Which actually proves that she does a voice. And speaking of putting up fronts, is it just me or is Clay giving you vibes that are not so straight? I feel like he's trying to be like his father when he talks to AD like, oh, baby, 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 hello, baby. Where are we chairs to though, baby? To us. To eternity. Let's go, baby. Doing straight boy drag. It's like, it feels very, mm, mm, mm. Also, the first thing he noticed when they were on the beach, when she showed him the ring that he gave her, it's like, mm, matches your nails. <laughs> we ain't go crazy with your nails. <laughs> Suave. <laughs> and that's why I love you, baby. Girl. <laughs> but on a serious note, Clay is convinced that he can't make a marriage work because he's convinced that he's going to end up cheating like his father did. But some people can make a marriage work without resorting to cheating. Happy marriages do exist. They just don't make the news. Like the union between Amy and Johnny. I don't want to change you at all. I like you. Like, I love you. Like, <laughs> you what? <laughs> Amy, I do love you. <laughs> okay, it's cute as fuck, but it's also boring as fuck. And that scene, like when they met up with his family, his sisters, and it was so sweet how Amy just seamlessly, she just fit into the family. It's adorable, you guys. But again, boring. No one is reviewing them. <laughs> the only thing people are talking about them is the drama like of him not wanting to have kids and unprotected sex. But people don't care to talk about the positive stuff. And why I think they have a healthy union, it's not like they're the perfect human beings, but they balance this kind of like desire. They clearly want each other. They keep loving on each other. And also they discuss like finance and kids in a very real way. Like they're challenging each other and they're saying, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. There's something very healthy of watching them together it's great you know things i want to do is i want to retire early so i do want to live like cutting back on certain things would you be okay with that too i feel like i could definitely get to that <laughs> so people like amy and johnny do exist people can make this balance work and they're the lucky ones i know all this i'm speaking from a certain amount of bitter experience you, you can v work very hard to keep a marriage together <laughs> And as you do so, you uh, may fail to recognize, you see, that you are being untrue to your own emotions. And you think, well, I must control my emotions for the sake of society, for the sake of everything <laughs> like that. And so you work and work. And one of the ways of working is to try to convince yourself that you're in love. And you go through the pretenses of love. You hypnotize yourself with loving language towards your partner. The more you work it and the harder you try like Jimmy does, the more promises and expectations you're building up for something you know you're not going to come through with on the end. I plan to be with you forever. Because Jimmy knows in the back of his mind, and he's known from the second he saw her, that he doesn't want this woman. You can tell like he's wearing this happy mask and smiling every time they're looking at each other. But the second she looks away, like he's using the moments of hugging her as a break 
to express what he really feels. Yeah, he kept going on and on about their first meeting and how much looks don't matter. Looks don't matter. I don't care what you look like. I love you for who you are. I'm, I am... <sighs> and bringing up the other girl, Jessica, at every given opportunity. Like, this is the moment where you first met. I, you know, you mean a lot to me. And it was... It was a roller coaster for me. And it's crazy when they were in bed together for the first time in the Dominican Republic. And she's like, once again, Chelsea, like fishing for compliments. Because she knows she can tell he's not into her. So she, she just wants reassurance that it's never going to happen. She's like, what is it that you like about me the most? What is the first thing you notice about me? And he tells her her big white teeth. Wow, girl. Big white teeth. Really? At least lie better. But as per usual, they convince each other, I love you, I love you. The amount of times these two tell each other they love each other. No, no, stop. And you know because they're shoving all that stuff down, it has to come out at some point. Like the next day when they were still in the Dominican Republic and they met with the other couples and Jimmy points out that AD, you know, has a curvy body and has a butt and all of that. And then Chelsea, who was clearly jealous and didn't like that comment, decides to act like she's not jealous. And she calls AD and says it in front of everyone. That woman is, does, is absolutely stacked. AD, hey, how you get a butt like that? Squats and Jesus, girl. That's it. I'm just impressed talking to you. Thank you. And then she gets very jealous about that whole thing and creates this fight at the end of the evening where she is... You hurt me. You hurt me. And that made me sad. It like hurts. It really hurts. She like babyfies her attachment wound, like thinking it's cute. You said hurtful comments. You made me feel uncomfy. Uncomfy. Look, disclaimer. I think it's very powerful and very empowering to recognize when someone hurts you and point it out, say, you know what? I don't like what you did. That hurt me. But you only say that once. You hurt me. I can't. I don't accept that. Yeah, and then you watch how they behave and how they correct it. I love you. I love you with my entire heart. And that's why I'm having this conversation why are you... with you. Because it hurt. But the reason she's hurt is because deep down inside, she knows Jimmy is not the guy for her. And her body was telling her that from the very beginning. Like the amount of times Chelsea wanted to throw up, literally throw up, when Jimmy was telling her what she wanted to hear is amazing. Like the first time he told her he loves her, she's like, oh, I'm gonna throw up. When they're about to meet, I'm gonna throw up. When she met him, I'm gonna throw up. Girl. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Uh, do you need to get that checked? Is your tummy okay? But she keeps overriding her system and what her body is telling her and convincing herself that she needs to stay with Jimmy and then force herself to start begging him to give her the validation that she needs, that she knows is never gonna come. And then she acts surprised when he calls her clingy. Truthfully, you've been a little clingy. Clingy. And also Jimmy himself is clingy, judging by what his friend said, like all he ever wanted was just, you know, to love on a girlfriend and he like doesn't give his girlfriend space. He said I was clingy. 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 <laughs> clingy. The yes, person who literally can't you, breathe without somebody pushing air you into you your lungs. Which is also very interesting. But even that, like even when we are clingy ourselves, when we find someone who clings to us that hard, we're like, ooh. Because probably we see ourselves in this behavior and we're like, this is gross. And again, when we're behaving in this way, we don't see ourselves. We don't see the easy choice, the right choice that is on the other side that we need to pick. Hi, what's your name? My name is Chelsea. My dog's name is Chelsea. And what is your name? My name is Trevor. Trevor? Yeah. My dog's name's Trevor too. <laughs> and again, we found out recently about Trevor from social media that he's an actor of the highest caliber because he, this whole teddy bear is apparently an act, but let's just go with what we saw on the show and we'll deal with that in the next video. Because as far as Chelsea was concerned, he was checking all the boxes. He's tender, he's sweet. He even like, they cheated and started telling each other how they look and he told her he had a mullet, which she loves. And he was joking about the mullet. He had a sense of humor about the mullet. Like he was checking every box. I don't know if I like someone that likes a mullet because like, are you okay mentally? <laughs> Also, at some point when they were still in the pods and she came to the girls in the women's quarter and she was like, someone just told me he loves me and I'm not used to that. I've always been treated badly by guys, just used to like mean guys. And here's this guy who loves me and you walk away from him. Trevor just told me he loved me and I'm so used to guys being mean to me. Like, I 
can't give you all of me right now. So you're choosing someone who was questioning if they wanted another girl versus someone who was 100% sure that they wanted you. And when she saw her friends later, they're asking her about the triangle that she found herself in, like between Trevor and Jimmy. So I definitely put him number one. Now. Wait, Time? Trevor or Jimmy? Trevor. 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 He, he told me he loved me and then didn't date anyone but me. <gasps> he went oh, in to propose. <gasps> Chelsea, oh no. Oh my God, how was that? Yeah, he told me he didn't date anyone else and that he wants me and only me and he proposed to me and he has a mullet, which I love, but, and her friends are like, oh, so why didn't you pick him? <laughs> I'm with Jimmy now. Excuse me? But the reason I think Chelsea chose Jimmy is because Jimmy initially wanted Jessica and she sees what Jessica looks like. And Jessica probably reminds her of all the pretty girls in high school that were better than her as far as social status goes. Like she basically wanted what the hot girl got. Because when she was telling her friends like, oh, he was the hot commodity. Everyone was interested in him. Girl. So he was the hot commodity. Oh, for sure. He was dating a bunch of girls. And I got him, basically. And I'm not gonna say too much about Jessica in this video because I feel like her story was cut short because she didn't get a proposal. But now they're teasing her and she's gonna appear again and probably at the reunion so i'm saving her for a later video but i want to say one thing about her in regards to the relatability and how we project ourselves onto the characters i found something very relatable about jessica the, how intense she is and how overpowering she is and that she's aware that how much she struggles to find someone who can handle all of her you like the idea of being with someone who's like as intense and as direct as i am but like I think it would probably be easier for you to be with someone who's a little bit more gentle. When he was being like a little bit of a child, when he was telling her that he doesn't want her, but he's not sure, but he's afraid. And, and he's telling her, oh, this is not fair. And she's like, to whom exactly? He's like, to you. How? She was not letting him off the hook. I'm going to tell you, like, if I even want it anymore, by the time you decide what you want to do, that is something I will need. You are never going to put me in this position again to where I'm left wondering how you feel about me. I love that integrity and standing up for herself. Now, if only she meant it, because <laughs> as we saw from how this whole thing is being teased, that she's gonna like dangle the carrot and tease Jimmy and she still wants to play games with Jimmy. If I were to see Jimmy again, it's gonna be like dangling temptation, like right in front of his face. It's the truth and you know it is. Because I saw an interview with Jimmy promoting the show recently, like just like yesterday, and he's the way he's talking about Jessica, well, first of all, the way he's talking about Chelsea seems like in the past, so I'm sure they didn't get married at the altar. But also the way he talks about Jessica, like such ego trip, like this ego game, like I'm not going to give her that satisfaction of DMing her. The way he talks, like... And then we did see Jess. She did say that you sent her a friend request. I know that woman loved the fact that I fought her and loved the fact that my request was sitting in her inbox. Jess would do anything for me to, to to be able to hang it over my head that I DM'd her or something. So like, I would never, I would never DM her. You know, these games in love, these ego games in love are sadly also very relatable and familiar. So what should we do when it comes to this madness we call love? Well, as I've often said, I'm not a preacher and therefore I don't know what you should do. <laughs> uh, but I would like to make some reflections on this particular form of madness. Falling in love is uh, a thing that strikes like lightning. There is not as yet a very clear rationale as to how it happens. Because we do know that it is opened to many people who never did anything to look for it. On the other hand, many people who have practiced uh, yoga or Zen disciplines for years and years and years have never seen it. But as yet, we are not clear as to why it comes about. And if there is any method of attaining it, the best one is probably to give up the whole idea of getting it. But if you are lucky enough to experience it, it would be indeed crazy to deny yourself that experience out of fear of being hurt. And what we therefore have to admit in our society so that we can contain this kind of madness, uh, we must be far more realistic about the marriage arrangement. Now, you see, this, this then means that when, when people marry, if they take a, a, any vows at all to each other, instead of saying that they will always be true to each other in the sense of meaning I will always love you, 
It means I will be true to you in the sense of I will always be truthful to you. I will not pretend that my feelings towards you are other than what they are. Well, thank you for wrapping that up because I can't make up, I can't form a sentence to figure out how to tell you how I feel. We, we should regard then a marriage as a, a mutual setting free of two people to live together in freedom and therefore in responsibility. Because the present situation, although it's pretending to be responsible, is in fact extremely irresponsible. Because it is dishonesty with respect to the way you feel towards another person. <sighs> Subscribe and stay tuned for my Palestine documentary. Free Palestine.